I'm Andrea Kimmick, a founding member of the Planeteers of Southern Maine. We are an ad hoc grassroots group that came together in 2016 to confront an ever emerging climate crisis, recognizing the drastic change in, changes in both climate and government. At the tail end of this evening's talk, we'll play a short three minute video, which serves to introduce more of us and might hopefully inspire some of you to join us in our many efforts. Planet Talks, such as tonight's, are only a small part of what we do, but an increasingly important one we're finding, especially during these recent years in which we are dealing with the pandemics of both COVID and climate change. So welcome all, and it's so, so wonderful to see so many familiar faces here. Um, tonight's talk is the first of a two-part workshop aimed to serve as a call to action and to remind us that we're here together and that when we come together, we can indeed make the world go round. If you haven't already registered for part two, a book discussion and community brainstorming event that will take place three weeks from tonight, also at uh, between six and seven, that's April 19th, please do. That link you'll find in the chat as well. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce you to our featured speaker today, Sue Inches, an optimist and advocate par excellence. Um, Sue envisions a world that is compassionate, inclusive, and environmentally aware, a vision that guided her through a 25-year career in public policy, including stints as deputy director of the Maine State Planning Office and program manager at the Maine Department of Marine Resources. Sue is actively engaged in advocacy work, serving on the board of Defend Our Health and the steering committee of the Pine Tree Amendment Coalition. She holds a BA in human ecology from College of the Atlantic and an MBA from the University of New Hampshire. Take it away, Sue. Thank you, Andrea. It's, it's really great to be here. You know, as I was sitting here listening and to the introductions, I was remembering going to Loud Home Farm in 1984 um, when that property was acquired for um, a preserve. And uh, I was on the staff at, of Maine Audubon at the time and our whole staff uh, went there one day to see this incredible property that was going to be acquired and turned into this um, wonderful center. So I, I was just remembering that just now um, and how great that was. And I also wanna say too that I'm really impressed with the Planeteers. I've gotten to know Andrea and Jen a little bit and I was looking at the Facebook page yesterday and thinking, wow, look at all the different things you're doing. I mean, it's really great. I love to see this, this grassroots activity. So I am really pleased to be here with you tonight. And so I'm gonna give a little slideshow. Um, it's gonna take about a half an hour um, probably to, to get through that. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards, as you've heard, and you could put your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but before I jump in, I just wanna just say a, just a couple words about why I wrote this book, uh, Advocating for the Environment. And, um, and of course, part of the reason was the urgency of the climate situation we're facing. But the other reason was that um, as I looked out there in the world, I saw like tons and tons of information about everything that's wrong with our environment and almost nothing about what we actually as ordinary people can do about it. Um, and there's actually a lot of good things going on in the environmental field right now. So not only have I written the book, but now I'm writing a newsletter and my newsletter focus is positive developments in the environmental field that are not being reported on pretty much by anybody. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm up to. And I am now going to share my screen with you so you can see these slides. So here we go. There we go, you should be able to see it now. Yes, people, yes, you can see that. All right, so um, finding hope in the face of climate change, that's the topic. And let me see, let's dance. There's the book, uh, which I hope you all will uh, eventually uh, get yourself a copy. And then let me start by saying that all of advocacy starts with your earth stories, your stories of how you connect with the earth. So my guess is that everybody in this call has some place they like to go or some experience they've had where they just felt awe and they just felt a connection with the earth. And so our earth stories, they can be positive and you can see the zinnias here. I love to grow uh, zinnias because they're just so beautiful and they make me happy. Sometimes our earth stories are not so positive. Um, it could be that there is a, uh, a lake you love to swim in and now it's too polluted. 
Um, maybe you're a fisherman and you used to go catch shrimp in Maine waters and now we don't have shrimp in Maine waters. So your stories, connection stories can be about love or about loss, but they're really the starting point for advocacy. And here's a little bit about why. So our stories are what ground us in our deepest truth. Um, they motivate us, they keep us going. Sometimes advocacy work can be hard going and you need to remember like, why am I doing all this? And when I need to do that, I think about either my flowers or the camping I like to do in the North Woods, those kinds of things. So um, your stories too can be directly related to a policy issue. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. So the power of your story in advocacy is that it creates a human connection with decision makers. So whether you're working with your town council, your city council, um, Maine state legislature, or even Congress, what you need to do as an ordinary citizen advocate is try to get to your, the heart of your decision maker. You're trying to make a human connection with them. And one of the things that um, a legislator said to me not long ago was, you know, after all things are said and done and all the testimony and everything, it's the stories that I remember when I go to vote on an issue. So our stories are what cut through opposition and trench beliefs and they create this platform for change. Stories also uh, shine a light on the truth. And one of my favorite uh, examples of that is fracking in Pennsylvania because what happened there was um, the oil and gas industry convinced the Pennsylvania legislature that fracking was deep underground, uh, nobody would really notice it, not an environmental issue, and the legislature went ahead and, and allowed fracking to be done anywhere. Uh, it actually uh, it, 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 uh, nullified local zoning. You could, you could put a fracking well in a schoolyard if you wanted to. Well, it wasn't until the citizens came forward and said, wait a second, you know, my farm animals are dying, um, my, well, my well is polluted, and fracking is a really big problem. And it wasn't until the citizens came forward and told their stories about what was happening that the truth was revealed. And in fact, uh, that legislation did get repealed uh, after the truth came out. So that's the importance of stories and advocacy work. So there are really two ways that stories get used in advocacy. And one is to internally ground and center you, as I've talked about. And the other is to show how ordinary people are affected by public policies. Now, I bet a lot of you might have heard of Fred Stone. Anybody heard of Fred Stone? Um, yeah, I see a few nods and hands there. Yep. Yeah. So Fred is a farmer in York County. Um, he has been in the farming business, his family, for three generations, 300 years, I think. Um, but unfortunately for Fred, he had been spreading a, a municipal sewage sludge on his farm fields and thinking this was a good fertilizer. And then unfortunately it turned out that there were toxic chemicals in the sludge. And so uh, ultimately Fred lost his animals. They were poisoned as well was polluted. Uh, and even his, himself and his family members have high levels of this toxin in their blood. But what Fred did was very courageous. He stepped forward and he told the um, Environment and Natural Resources Committee of the legislature his story about losing his farm because of these chemicals. And because he did that, he actually started a movement nationwide to ban PFAS chemicals. And Maine is actually, uh, many of you might know this, we are in the lead on that. We have banned a lot of products that have this chemical. We are starting to figure out how we can clean it up. Um, the work is ongoing, but it all started with Fred telling his story. And that, that pretty much uh, sealed the direction of this. And now I think there are 15 other states um, that are looking to ban these chemicals. And even the EPA is talking about uh, banning PFAS chemicals, but it all started with Fred's story. So I cannot emphasize enough how important citizen voices are in the policymaking process. So we all kind of wish that politicians or even corporate leaders would, you know, take the lead and do the right thing. But the thing is, the problem is they're not going to stick their neck out unless they know there's support behind them. It's just a fact of life. They, they won't do it uh, unless we show that we're there, we've got their backs. So the other thing is that um, if we don't have citizen voices, what we tend to get is corporate public policy. There are a lot of paid lobbyists out there that are writing laws that then they introduce into legislatures and then they get passed. And if citizens don't speak up, that's what we get. And, in, and then what happens is the environmental injustices just, just grow. 
And I'll give you an example. So there are quite a few um, uh, conservative think tank groups out there writing legislation. Uh, one of them is ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, there are others, the Heritage Foundation, um, the uh, Conservative Political Action Committee, CPAC. There's quite a few of them. But anyway, I'm just going to give you a quick slice of what we're up against here so you can see it. So ALEC is, um, it's the members and supporters are the Coke Industries, Chevron, Big Pharma, many fossil fuel companies. And what they do is they write model legislation and then they introduce it across the country and in Congress. And so this slide shows you, these are just some of the examples of the legislation there they have written. Uh, so one recent one is this law that would penalize banks and financial institutions that divest from fossil fuels. Um, so what that would do is if, if a bank or financial institution uh, makes a commitment to divest, then this law would make it so they can't handle any public accounts. Well, all of um, you know municipalities, states, they all have their money in banks held by banks. I mean, there's a big market in, in the you know banking services that are offered. This would mean that they, they would be basically cut off from that whole side of their business. The second one on here is kind of interesting. I put it in because it's one that I faced in the Maine state legislature. So ALEC introduced legislation in Maine that said local communities can't build broadband networks. Well, the really interesting thing there is that the only communities that would even consider doing that are the ones that are not served by internet service providers, right? So we have islands, um, the, the Isles, Islesboro, the Cranberry Islands, they have their own fiber networks because nobody else is gonna go there uh, and provide internet service. And yet Alec was trying to make that illegal for them to do that. So anyway, that just was one that I, unfortunately, uh, the main legislature is pretty smart, pretty savvy. And when this bill was introduced, they immediately defeated it. So um, that was a good thing. A couple other examples, um, you know, Alec would like to see the EPA unable to uh, regulate greenhouse gases, uh, take away that authority. Another one um, would, would, would uh, block Congress's ability to, to enforce the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. So the reason I bring this up is because some of this opposition is pretty serious. And that's why we need citizen voices to speak up uh, about about these things, because otherwise these things can get railroaded through and it's not good for any of us. So having said that, this is why decision makers need you. Without your stories and experience, they don't know the impact of their decisions. Um, and then as I've been talking about this too, it's like the balance of power is kind of off. You know, we have a lot of highly paid lobbyists working full time to introduce things that are not necessarily good for Maine people or for any people. And we need citizens to balance that off and say, hey, wait a minute, um, you know, barring uh, communities from uh, providing internet service, that's not good for us. That's not what we want. So that's how important it is. Um, and then of course, as a citizen advocate, you're taking abstract concepts, these are laws, and you're, you're making it real. You're saying, well, this is how this law plays out in my town or my neighborhood or whatever. So that's another important role that citizens play. And then finally, if you actually come, you know, to a decision maker with a solution, that is a gift. That is a huge gift. Our, our citizens legislature here in Maine are uh, basically volunteers and they don't have a staff. And so um, if you and your group can figure out something and say, hey, you know, what we really want is, is, is this and come to them with an idea, um, that actually is a very helpful thing. That's a gift to them. So citizens are more powerful than they think. One of the questions I ask when I'm teaching a class is how many phone calls do you think it takes to move a legislator? I don't know if anybody wants to shout out a guess here or put their hand up what they think. Yep, I see a five. That is the right answer. Hey, <laughs> Richard Nelson, hi, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, it only takes five phone calls. Um, it's, it's amazing how few people really do uh, take action and uh, many legislators have told me this, you know, really just if a small group of people, five or 10 people come forward, that's enough to move them on an issue. So um, the other thing I like to say here is that um, as an ordinary person, you don't have to be an expert. Um, if you have facts and data, that's great. Uh, it's wonderful. But really the thing that's important is to say that you care and why. And the next slide actually is an example. I just, a um, friend of mine, um, uh, sent a letter to her legislator about the pine tree amendment, which I'll 
tell you what that is later. But anyway, this slide is her letter. She just says, you know, this is coming up for a vote. I'm a healthcare provider. I care about this. It's really important. End of letter. So that's that's how simple this is. You know, I think people get a little intimidated sometimes and think, well, I, I don't really know enough about this issue to speak up about it. Well, you don't have to know everything. Um, it's it's important that they hear from you. That's the important thing, not not how much you know. So let's um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back for a minute and talk about some environmental history. Um, so in 1969, um, it was a really interesting time. It was just at the time when uh, families had gotten televisions and, and families would sit around in the evening and watch the news together. And several things came on the news in 1969 that were significant. And one was an oil spill off of Santa Barbara. Uh, it spilled 3 million gallons and it was like a 36 mile oil slick. And they showed that on the news, you know, from, t from airplanes, you know, here's a view of this oil slick and we we're all pretty horrified by that. And then the Cuyahoga River uh, caught fire. Now it's interesting that river is, uh, it's just near Cleveland, Ohio. And it had caught on fire many times before but it had never been broadcast on television. So uh, in 1969, you could actually see the flames uh, leaping into the sky on the evening news. I actually was a kid and I saw this um, and we're all like, just like horrified by that. And then also there was a lot of footage about smog over Los Angeles and it was so thick that you couldn't see the mountains at all that, that surround that city. So these were images that, that came into our living rooms for the first time. And as a result of those stories, those images, we had the very first Earth Day. And the first Earth Day was in April of 1970. And the key thing to know about it is that 20 million Americans participated. 20 million Americans. That uh, resulted in all of the major policy, environmental policy that we rely on now. So if you look at this slide, these are just examples. Um, you'll see familiar things, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, and EPA was established. All of these things were passed in that 10 year period between 1970 and 1980. The entire foundation of our environmental law was created in that 10 year period. And it was all a result of that very first Earth Day. Well, now I wanna look at a comparison between where we were then and where we are now. OK, so the most recent major public event for the environment we've had was the climate strikes in September of 2019. And so if you look at this, what you'll see is participation in the US. I'm not counting Europe and all of that, but the US was four million. And since 1970, our population has grown hugely. So the percentage of the US population is only 1.8 percent. So really interesting. So back in 1970, we had 10% now 1.8. And then at the same time, the environmental threats have grown significantly. So that Santa Barbara oil spill that was really hard, very devastating, and we were all horrified by it at the time, spilled a total of 3 million gallons. The Deepwater Horizon, which blew up in 2010, spilled 134 million gallons. So the scale has gone way up of the environmental threats and yet the participation has gone down. So the question is, this is a question for all of us, is can we create the critical mass like we had on the first Earth Day? I mean, this is really what, what's facing us right now. And as the climate crisis kind of bears down on, it, this, on us, this is what we have to be kind of thinking about. Now, I think the answer is yes. We can do it, and I'm going to tell you why. Well, it's all related to this quote, power is infinite. And this quote was from Eric Liu. He wrote the book, You're More Powerful Than You Think, which is great. Um, he was an advisor to President Obama. He's a writer and a speaker, and he's actually very involved in democracy issues um, these days. But his quote, power is infinite. So what did he mean by that? Well, here it is. So citizen power comes from two places. One is your personal power, like we've talked about, what you care, what you care about, your earth connection stories, your commitment, your experience. These are all what ground you in your, in your personal power. But then there's organizing power. And this is what Eric Liu is talking about when he says power is infinite, is that the power of the people to organize is, is always there and it is infinite. So, there are stories after stories of really disempowered groups who are 
able to create big change. Uh, one of the ones I talk about in my book is um, the tomato pickers in Florida who were almost all um, Mexican immigrants and they didn't speak English and they did not have, um, like there was no restrooms on the field. They were paid way below minimum wage. They lived in substandard housing without plumbing. I mean, they had nothing. And what they did is they decided to go on strike against Campbell Foods. And they got um, a lot of faith-based groups and other groups to support them. They did a boycott of um, Campbell's products. And within about three or four years, they got everything they asked for. They got benefits, they got restrooms, they got better housing, they got better pay. So it's just an example of how even people who are really low on the power scale, if they organize, they have power. And so we can do the same thing. And so that's what I think Eric is talking about when he says power is infinite. So here at this point, I like to always make a little distinction between uh, what is advocacy and what is direct action. So advocacy, at least in the technical sense, is about building relationships with decision makers. You're working inside the system when you do that. You're providing information, you're asking the decision makers to do what you want them to do. Direct action, in contrast, is speaking out publicly. Um, so you're working outside the system. This is where you have protests and you know, people who are obstructing um, pipelines and all of that kind of thing. And the way to think about this is to think um, about the Glasgow summit back in November. And uh, so John Kerry, he would be the advocate, right? He, he worked for months and months before and also weeks during this uh, summit to negotiate. And he put together these deals. Um, there was an agreement to reduce methane emissions. Uh, there was an agreement to end deforestation. He was doing that relationship building and negotiation that advocates do. And then Greta Thunberg, she was doing the direct action. She came in and brought lots of media attention with her and spoke out publicly about her view that we're not doing enough fast enough. Um, so just to give you that kind of sense that there's many different roles that people can play. Um, and not everybody's comfortable uh, doing direct action. Not everybody's comfortable talking to decision makers. It takes different kinds of people to do different things. You know, my career has mostly been in the advocacy side, uh, working in the main legislature. I've done a few direct action things here and there. Um, but other people, you know, my great friend and mentor, George Lakey, he loves to be the direct action guy. Um, he went in a grandparents uh, for, you know, ending uh, the climate crisis walk last fall. And I asked him, I, after it was over, I said, how'd it go? He goes, oh my gosh, he got a, I said, I got a, a, arrested for the 22nd time. He was really excited about this. He was like, yes, I succeeded. I got arrested. I was in jail. It was great, right? Where I don't think I really want to go to jail. So that just shows you how, you know, different people have different takes on things. And what I like to tell people is that there are many, as many ways to be an advocate as there are people. So there's a role for everybody, whether that's whether you like to be a photographer, um, whether you like to provide the food, whether you like to be the one in the negotiating room, there's a role for everyone. And I like to say that advocacy is for everyone. And a lot of people say to me, well, yeah, I, I would love to do that, but I just don't have time. I mean, I've got kids, I've got a job, I've got someone, you know, and what I, my answer to their question on that is find a way to advocate in what you're doing already. So in other words, if you are a landscaper, um, you might counsel your uh, clients to not put toxics on their lawn. If you work in a restaurant, you might um, lobby for locally sourced food and explain why that's important. So kind of where I'm going with this is that in order to address the climate crisis, everybody has to participate that's how big it is it's, it's it's like we're in a war it's like everyone has to figure out how they can contribute it's like i like to uh, compare it to the second world war which none of us were really alive for but it, what i understand from that is that everybody had a role i mean grandparents were um sending cards to some soldiers in europe and and young women were taking jobs in the trades and other people were you know, rolling bandages and making care packages. Everybody participated. Same thing's true for the climate crisis. Everyone needs to participate. Everybody needs to figure out what they can do in their daily life that can um, support the earth. 
So the other thing that citizen advocates do is they challenge the status quo. This is really important. And one of my favorite success stories is Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And the reason I like this story is because um, when I was growing up, um, there, drunks were considered to be um, you know, very funny. There were skits on television um, showing drunk people tripping over things and running into things. We all were laughing about it. And you know, yes, sure enough, uh, drunk drivers were um, you know, injuring and killing people. But whenever that happened, we just kind of like wring our hands and send our thoughts and prayers. And that was kind of the way it was. Well, Mothers Against Dr Drunk Driving said, hey, wait a minute, time out. Um, drunk driving is a crime and people should be held responsible uh, for doing that. And so they were really good organizers and campaigners and they have completely changed how we view drunk driving. Now we assume that it's a crime. People should lose their license, pay a fine. Um, there should be a designated driver if we've all been out drinking, all of that sort of thing. They completely changed uh, how we look at that issue and it's because they challenged the status quo and organized around it. Another one of our great success stories are, is our rivers. Um, the pictures on the slide are both the Cuyahoga that we talked about uh, before it, the cleanup and after the cleanup. We have completely changed our views of, of rivers. Now they're considered to be valuable um, you know, property and, and we put uh, walking trails and parks on our rivers and consider that a great municipal asset where it used to be that rivers were industrial waste streams, basically. So an, again, another success story we've had. Um, the next slide, this is a visual uh, image. Um, you might know where this is. This is actually the road to Popham Beach State Park in about 1962. And back at that time, it was really common to see junk cars and stuff all over the place, all over the sides of the road like this. And it wasn't until we woke up and said, wait a minute, what are we doing throwing our junk everywhere in public? Um, we ought to really clean our act up, and we did. And so that's another success story. And here's another photo. This one I think might be Old Orchard Beach. Um, but anyway, it's another picture from the early 60s. And this is what things look like. We took it for granted until we didn't, until we challenged the status quo and said, wait a minute, we want something different from this. So social change. Um, I've always been kind of a student of social change. I've always been interested in how it happens. And it almost always starts with a moral question. Is it right to allow intoxicated people to drive? Um, is it right to allow industrial waste to flow freely down our rivers? And then the, the question that I love here is, is it right to leave the climate crisis for the next generation to solve? Um, this question first was asked in about 2018. Uh, Greta Thunberg and her school strike uh, and some others who supported her came out and said, is this right? And that's when I saw the pivot point happening. We started to turn the corner there. We have a lot of work to do, absolutely a lot of work to do, but it, you, we can't do it at all until we've asked this question. So I really was excited when I heard this. I was like, yes, finally, somebody's asking, asking the question and it's the right question. So here are a few areas that I think it's critical that we start asking this moral question. Uh, burning fossil fuels. I mean, we know it's, it's pollution. We know it's bad for our health. We know it's gonna be catastrophic for the planet if we continue. And yet nobody's really asked the question, should we continue burning fossil fuels? I mean, we're still leasing, allowing oil leases, right? And so we need to get um, you know, harder on this question. And they have actually in some other countries. I know in Denmark, um, you, you cannot uh, buy or sell or install an oil or gas uh, burner there. It's illegal it's because they've asked the question, is it right to continue burning fossil fuels given what we know? And the answer, of course, is no. Corporate accountability is a huge one. Um, so um, I, I'm, we're just starting to see the very sort of edge of this question coming up. But the question is, should we allow corporations to um, have no limits on their profits and not clean up uh, after their operations. I mean, typically what happens is, you know, corporations, um, you know, create all kinds of different pollution and then the taxpayers come in later and clean it up. I have a real moral problem with that. I don't think that's the right way to do things at all. Those who made money from doing something, they're the ones that should clean it up. And I think we're just beginning to see this, but we've got to ask this question more. Consumption and waste, of course, we need to ask the question there and then, Women's rights and family planning, I always like to bring this up because when I was doing research um, for the book, 
one of the things that I was really struck by was that 174 million women in the world would love to be able to choose. Um, no, I think it's actually two, I'm sorry, 275 million love to be able to choose the number of children they have, but they have no access to family planning services. So that technology is available. I think that the, the moral question is, shouldn't women have uh, the choice of how many children uh, she has? And if, if, if they did, I think we would have um, much better um, you know, situations in some countries um, where um, all the research shows that economies are better, uh, child nutrition is better, education is better, all kinds of things improve, including the environment, um, if there is access to family planning. So now I'm gonna diverge for just a second and talk about a main issue that's right in front of us. Uh, it's called the Pine Tree Amendment. And what this is, and I know some of you know about it, and Richard Nelson, I've seen your video uh, about it. Um, it. Basically, it would add the right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment to our state constitution. And Maine, uh, Montana, Pennsylvania, and New York already have these rights, and 13 states are working on it. So where we are right now is the legislature was going to vote on this today, actually, um, but it was delayed uh, because there was some doubt coming up from the uh, Department of um, Transportation. And we thought, well, maybe we can put that fire out and try to vote maybe Thursday, or it's going to be very, very soon. Um, but let me talk for a minute about why this actually matters. So constitutional rights would um, basically guide all of our environmental laws and policies, which would be a very positive kind of proactive thing uh, to have in place. The other thing about constitutional rights is they're basically permanent. Um, what we saw um, is that um, environmental laws can get changed depending on the politics of the day. So um, during the LePage administration, many laws were repealed, uh, environmental laws, and many of them were just simply not enforced. And so, you know, basically, rather than have our, our health, our environmental health, uh, subject to politics of the day, why not have them in our constitution so that, you know, they are permanent and we also will know that our children and grandchildren will, will have uh, these rights. So there's that piece. And then a lot of people don't understand this, but there's a huge um, environmental justice piece to this too. And what it is, is that if every person has the right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment, then it gets very hard to put a toxic chemical plant in a low-income neighborhood. You can't do it because basically the nonprofit organizations and the legal organizations will come in and sue. So basically, if you give everybody um environmental rights it really evens the playing field and and basically uh takes away most of the opportunity for environmental racism to, to happen so that's a really powerful tool and then finally of course um these constitutional rights would give citizens recourse if there was um you know egregious and harmful actions taken that would you know endanger their health and their environmental rights and the, the picture on the slide actually is the tank farm in South Portland. And um, my thought on that is that if we had had environmental rights, I think probably uh, the people that live next to these tank farms that apparently have been emitting uh, toxic fumes for a lot of, lot of years beyond the, the uh, state standards and the federal standards, I think the people would have been able to solve this more quickly if they'd had environmental rights in place. They did not. So uh, they're still kind of fighting about it. But anyway, so there's just so many things that could be improved if we had constitutional rights to a clean and healthy environment. So um, having said that, um, if you want to do something right away, you could contact your legislator and ask to them to support this and make sure that they do because every day people are kind of like, yes, I'm gonna vote for it or maybe not, or you know, it really helps to hear from people who are saying, yes, I care about this and I want you to support it. So that's another reason for my bringing it up tonight. And I know the Planeteers have been working on this and I've seen Andrea and Jen in the state house and I have seen Richard Nelson's video on the Pine Tree Amendment website. Um, and there are probably others of you here in this audience who may also have taken action on it. And it's really important, even if we don't pass it right now, um, the, the progress we've made uh, in a, just a very short time of about a year is incredible. Um, if it doesn't pass this time, we'll bring it back uh, and it will eventually prevail, I, I feel pretty sure. So it's just a matter of sticking with it until it does. 
So here's the thinking that I want to leave you with here, and then we'll get to the questions and answers. Um, but I want to tell you that the current disruptions may be our best opportunity in years. So we are living in really turbulent times. There's no question about that. Um, but here's the thing is that if everybody was satisfied with the way things are, then there would be no opportunity opportunity to change anything. But the fact that we have the climate crisis and we have Black Lives Matter and we have um, you know, authoritarian regimes trying to assert their power. We have all these things. In fact, the next slide will show you, we've got a lot of things coming at us right now. And it's pretty scary. And sometimes I have to turn the news off because I just can't take any more. Um, but the truth is, is that this is a huge opportunity to create and transform the world. In fact, in the 1960s, we'll go back to the uh, first Earth Day for a second. Um, there was a whole lot of turbulence going on there. There was the Vietnam War, there was the civil rights movement, there was the women's movement, there was all the environmental stuff going on. Um, so they too were in a period of, uh, of turbulence and out of that came the Civil Rights Act, all of the environmental legislation, great gains for women. We ended the Vietnam War and in fact, I think it's it's hard to imagine us going in going to war in another country where we don't really have a threat you know so we we really did transform a lot and i think we're in the same place today we really are it's like we're right poised for some pretty big changes so here's the pivot point question you know will we create a world that's more compassionate more equitable and healthy for everyone are we going to do it or are we just going to continue on as usual and be too busy to really do anything about it that's sort of the question uh in front of all of us and what I would say is that to have a healthy future, it will take all of us working together in ways that support each other and support life. And here's the thing, it's that life on earth has to be our highest priority, right? So it has to be higher priority than profits, higher priority than you know a certain group stays in power. It really has, we really have to be focused on life, all of life, each, how we treat each other, how we treat people that are different from us, how we treat plants and animals and the earth itself. That's if we can, if we can come together and create a world where life is the highest priority of all, we will have done it. So I'll leave you to ponder that. And um, we will go on to questions and my contact information is here as well. So uh, um, feel free to reach out to me if you would like to do that. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you. There we go. Great, so I'm happy to entertain your questions. Yeah, and remember you can either type them in the chat if you're more comfortable with that or raise your hand um, with the icon or just raise it in person and we'll be able to see you. There's few enough of us on. I just want to say thank you, Sue. I love where you kind of left things too with the appreciation or reminder that of the moral stance to um, honor and protect and prioritize life. Yeah. I find that too, too frequently people get caught up in color wars of sorts mm -hmm. and how unfortunate that is when in fact we all share this one thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just wonderful. And then I have a question actually, not so much for you, but for some of the people whose names I recognize from the area here, wondering um, if any of you were involved in that wonderful example, similar to the ones that Sue's been talking about, but where uh, Kenny Bunk, a small group of resident citizens, maybe a handful or so, stopped Nestle from taking, from going to a 50 year contract with the KKW, mm. our water supply. It happened before my time here. So Vicki, yeah, if you can talk about that or Paul, someone there's a wonderful example of, of of david and goliath sort of thing mm -hmm. that this was a this was a done deal until someone had happened upon this <clears throat> information i remember being in a group of people outside the water district on main street but i i don't really i'm not privy to the real details of what happened but i was part of the group out there <laughs> If somebody else has more to say about it, that would be great. 
I'm just going to say, because I really applaud that. When I learned of that, I was like just really wowed by it. It reminded me of all the little, the so-called little things that we planeteers are working on in the area and that we hope others will join us in is that sometimes, and it gets back to what Sue was talking about, the five calls into a legislator mm -hmm. and the impact those can have, each one, even one by itself. And like something like that, a small group of people stopped Nestle's 50 year contract with Kenny Bunk to, to own its water. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, um, actions are taken because the assumption is nobody's going to respond. So that's how we ended up with um, Cancer Alley, which is the 100 miles between uh, Baton Rouge and and uh, New Orleans, and there's 150 petrochemical and plastics plants there and a ton of toxic waste and the highest cancer and COVID rates in the country. And the reason those are all located there is because they figured, well, these are all low income areas and people are not gonna, you know, people aren't gonna speak up. And actually what's happening now is people are speaking up. It's gonna be very difficult to locate any more of the, that kind of thing there. But it, for a long time, People just thought, well, you know, we need jobs and, you know, um, it'll be okay. And of course it hasn't been okay. So. So we have a question, hand raised uh, with Tom. Tom, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, Sue, for, for your message of uh, that we don't need to be experts, but you just need to care. Uh, that's something that we planeteers, uh, you know, certainly, certainly believe in. And to piggyback on to what Andrea was saying about, about uh, how, how small groups of people or individuals can really make a difference, we're all familiar with um, the fifth grader here in Kennebunk who started the campaign to get rid of single-use plastic bags in the grocery stores. And I, I imagine, I'm, I'm sure other, other towns possibly had, had done it before that, but, but when, when it, it becomes like a critical, like a towards a critical mass sort of thing, like when one town does it and another town does it. So I was surprised uh, some and fairly recently and within the last couple of months to realize that even Biddeford and you think of Biddeford being, you know, these are kind of a blue collar kind of town where people really just focus on their paychecks or something. But no, they really care because they've gotten rid of plastic bags. They've even gotten rid of paper bags. If you go to a store, you need to bring your own bag or carry it out in your arms, you know, so um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Nancy, looks like you have a question. Go ahead. Actually, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, Sue, I really appreciated your comparison. Um, the times we're in right now are so turbulent and so unpleasant. Um, yeah. But it, you're taking us back to, you know, the 1968-9 with the Vietnam War and civil rights and women's rights. I mean, some of those are still with us today, but mm -hmm. it was just nice to have that perspective. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, it really is a similar kind of a time and we do have an opportunity to make the changes that we want to see happen. I see a hand up, Maggie. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I thought it was very interesting, Sue, that you compared the, the the numbers of people who really were concerned about the environment and got involved in, in working, you know, to make a change in the 1960s. And yet today see, things seem so much more dire and there are fewer people. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering why that is. And a lot of the reading that I've been doing around this issue suggests that people are, are, are environment, I don't know if you'd call it environmentally weary or climate weary, or they feel that that it's it's so far advanced that that they there's no chance of stopping it. It's sort of um, an interesting place to be, and the the reading that I've done suggests that the doom sort of scenario of if we don't act we aren't going to survive is not the way to go. But I'm wondering in your experience whether you would agree with that. And, and if so, what kind of scenario is it, what kind of scenario really works to encourage people 
to care about these issues? Is it the fact that there are a lot of things that are not being reported on that that are really positive? Because to me, that suggests that, well, wait a minute, there is movement. And so if I join this, maybe I can help move things further along. I I'm just curious what your take is on that. That's a, a really great question. So thank you for that, because I really think there's a number of things going on. One is um, that our media is completely focused on fear. And so um, you're right that a lot of positive things are happening, but they're not being reported on much at all. And um, in fact, I'll, I'll put a little advertisement in for myself. I, I do a new monthly newsletter and um, you can get it by going to my website at Sue Inches. At, um, it's it's www.sueinches.com. Um, you can sign up for it. But what I report on every month is positive developments in the environmental field, which are many, but we just don't hear about them much at all. Um, so, um, so there is sort of that. And, and then the other thing that's happening is that because of all this fear-based um, media, which is just, it's, it's all around us. It's social media, it's television, it's radio, it's everywhere. It's hard to feel positive sometimes um, with this kind of culture all around us. Um, and so I, I mean, I personally, you know, I have to turn it off, uh, uh, to, you know, intentionally because after I've had enough of it, it's like starting to drag me down. And I, I, I agree with um, what you said, Maggie, actually about, um, you know, the doom kind of talk is actually demotivating. And there's been actually studies about that too, that, you know, people just get overwhelmed and like, well, what, gee, what, you know, what does it matter what I do? Because, you know, we're all doomed anyway. It's just, that's a terrible, um, you know, message. And it just makes people feel not motivated to do anything. Um, and yet, you know, what I, I really believe what I am saying that we have an opportunity to transform how we treat each other and how we treat the earth. And we're already seeing it with all of the um, Black Lives Matter and Matters and LBGTQ. And I mean, there's a whole movement going on of really learning how to respect people who are different from us. And I, I think the same thing I would love to see with the environment too, like how, you know, respecting plants and animals and the earth's processes. And, and it, we're seeing it, you know, there's been a lot written on how the forest is a living ecosystem. It's not just separate different things all happen to be in the same place. It's actually a whole living organism as a whole. So we're starting to, our understanding actually is growing uh, about all of these things, but um, it's not much about, it's not, we don't hear about that, um, you know, on the media and the news. And I, I, I mean, you, you don't have to agree with me here, but I, I kind of feel like the media has not been taking responsibility for the messaging and the effect it has on people. You know, they think you know, they're doing the right thing by, you know, talking about every problem that came up today. But what I, the problem I have with that is that it's completely problem focused. It's not solutions focused at all. And so, and that was part of writing my book is I want to, you know, I want to write a book that's solutions focused and it is um, because we're not getting that um, from other places. So that, that's a very deep and question to be thinking about our whole culture and how it's kind of gone in a certain direction uh, and it's making a lot of us unhappy a lot of the time and, and keeping us from, um, you know, really finding our greatest gifts and finding our greatest strength as a people together. So, yeah. So, uh, Richard has his hand up. Okay. Yeah, I, I was uh, thinking when Sue was talking about the, the don't have to be an expert. I, I recall I, I was helped a lot. Uh, when I first started, well, I was a fisherman for many years, as many of you, some of you know. Uh, and I came, came out and I worked with the Island Institute and I was taught how to write uh, comments for government things. And, things. and one, of the, one of the important things is to establish yourself as an expert. And, and I, I would differ with Sue a little bit in, in say that every one of us is an expert mm -hmm. and you just have to learn how to describe that and, and it's important in in kind of a written comments it's it's important if you're writing a letter to the editor or 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 an opinion piece or anything to to keep to capture a little bit of that it could be something as like 
I've been a gardener for 15 years and I see differences out there. I see climate change or something. Or it could be I am I'm that mother who sees how the, my child is affected by something or that nurse practitioner who's, uh, who sees different lung problems and things going on with, with the air quality or, or whatever. But think about it and see what, how, how is it your life is it been affected by, by what's going on with the uh, climate and establish yourself as, as an expert because we all, we all are, that's why we care. So that's just a different sort of a, uh, I think it's important to to state that and uh, realize it for yourself. Yeah. I love that. That's a really great way to, to, to articulate it because we are, all of us are an expert on something, uh -huh. you know, um, you know, you, you, if you talk to the sportsmen who like to hunt or fish, they'll tell you about the changes they've seen. Um, they're experts on that part of it. Right. So we, we, yeah, everybody is. And so we need to share that expertise. I see, let's see. Yeah, Jen, I see your hand. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the generational evolution of advocacy because I grew up in Northeastern Ohio and I was born in 1969. And I grew up paddling on the Cuyahoga that had been cleaned. And now I live here and with my advocacy, I feel like each generation is building, you know, like Sue was saying, there are positive things happening that we aren't hearing about now, but there's so many positive things happening. And if we keep doing this, then the kids are going to see that and they're going to benefit from what we did. And I benefit from what they did. And it just, that's what is hopeful to me. And if we can connect with people that care about the same things, then more power. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'll make a little comment here too is that, um, you know, I teach college students and, um, you know, some of them get pretty down and out about all the climate science that they've studied and that sort of thing. And then they come to my class and we actually do projects, advocacy projects in the class. And basically, if you take action, if you take any action, even if it's a small action, you feel better. You actually, it can really be therapeutic in a, in a way. So I always encourage people about that. You know, if you if you you know uh, take an evening and write a letter to your state senator or something like that, you're, you're gonna you're gonna feel a lot better. <laughs> so there's sort of that aspect of it too. I see Karen hand up. Sorry, I don't know how to do that. Um, oh, you're reminding me. I've been participating at the Portsmouth Public Library with. Um, over the last like the three years ago before the pandemic, we did these things called handprint parties um, and was focused on uh, with some um, thinking out of somebody out of, I think out of Southern Maine actually, who talked about the um, psychology of the climate, your climate footprint and how that is a really negative psychology versus coming up with your climate handprint and thinking about the positive psychology mm -hmm. and how empowering that is and what you can do with that. And it's completely transformed my thinking about my role. Um, it's, it's a nice, nice, uh, if you, if, and, and that was part of where they came up with it was because working with students that were like, it would just be better if I had never been born. And they're like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this project if that's the way we're talking. Yeah. So yeah, just to endorse that. That's really great. Yeah. What, uh, Tom, yeah. Mom, I see a hand. Yeah. You know, uh, going back to the uh, the media and how they thrive on fear and, and because fear sells, um, Sue or anybody, I wonder if anybody's done any, you know, focused polling with the idea of convincing the corporate bosses that in the in the you know television corporations that there actually is an audience out there for positive news because it, it seems like if there if there's dollars behind it that might sway them do you know of any, does anybody know of any concerted efforts in in this regard i actually don't but i'd be really interested in it do you now sue or did i hear in your bio are you connected with one of the universities around in, in maine 
Um, I've taught uh, um, as an adjunct at Colby and Bates Colleges. Well, um, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll start sending some letters to or contacting some of the universities to see if um, they're. Um, somebody might undertake some sort of polling, you know, using uh, university students who might be interested in conducting this. Yeah. That'd be that's a great, a, that's great a, perfect, project. a perfect example of why we are hoping to have this talk with Sue, because we're mm -hmm. hoping that what would come out of this is people, you know, getting energized and seeing new ways, new routes to, you know, to advocate. So that's great, Tom. No, yeah, no, yeah. thanks for the inspiration. Mm -hmm. I should have invited the journalists from the local papers to attend this this talk tonight. <laughs> well, we'll definitely bring them for the next one, and and refer them to the recording of this one so that they'll be prepared, like we all will be. You know, one of the things I'll just make a comment. This kind of goes back to um, a question before, but. Um, the, the, there's a lot of research going on about the fossil fuel companies and um, what they knew and when they knew it and that kind of thing. And it sort of turns out that they were campaigning uh, quite hard to make the climate crisis all of our problem. It was all our individual carbon footprints. And they actually, they, they invented the term carbon footprint because they wanted it to be like all of us to think that it was our fault so that they could continue to drill for uh, oil and to, to burn fossil fuels and all of that. So um, there's a lot of research going on uh, with, the, with the purpose of uh, creating accountability uh, for those companies. And um, actually this is a positive news story, um, is that uh, there are so far 22 uh, cities and towns uh, in this country suing fossil fuel companies for climate damage saying, Basically, you created this, you pay to clean it up. It's not our issue. You know, it's not up to us in this town or city to pay for all this. And so along with those lawsuits is basically, so what, what, what have the fossil fuel companies sort of been up to? And the first thing they did was they created doubt around climate science um, and, and, and tried to make the carbon footprint be all of our problem instead of their problem. And now um, they switched because now uh, one in four people, I think it is, have experienced some effect of climate change, whether it's a flood or a storm or a tornado or whatever, a fire. Um, so they can't, they, it's really not selling well to try to deny or create doubt around climate science. So now what they're saying is, oh, well, no, we're the companies that are investing in renewable energy. Well, then the data is showing that, um, you know, basically the, of the five major fossil fuel companies, I think it was, um, they're investing 0.2% of their investments in renewables and then, you know, 99.8% in, uh, in oil exploration and extraction. So again, they're telling a story that's really not true uh, to try to um, not be accountable. And there's a lot of really good work going on to make them accountable. And people feel that this will be people working on that say, well, this will be bigger than tobacco. This will be, you know, they will be held accountable. It's just a matter of time. And so the, all the research is happening, the legal work is starting. And so I think we're gonna see this uh, playing out uh, in, uh, in the next five, 10 years in a pretty big way. And I see Maggie's hand is up again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just, just a comment, if people have not heard of our children's trust, yeah. Um, that is another lawsuit that's been, that's not only national, it's not only in this country, it's also international at this point, where youth are suing their governments for mm -hmm. a livable world. And if you have not heard of them, you can Google them and they are always looking for support. I support them on a regular basis because a lot of the lawyers that are representing them in courts do it pro bono. So, um, it's it's it just raises the visibility and it's you saying look folks you know we we need and deserve and want a livable planet and we're going to try and get that even if it has to go through the court system so it's really just another avenue um, for for leverage around this issue and the other thing quickly i would say is um public public television 
the news hour um, on public television does periodic good news stories about the environment uh, that Sue, you were mentioning the good things that are happening. They recently did one on geothermal and the massive exploration that's happening around that non-polluting, um, you know, doesn't, they, they reuse the water. It's, it's very sustainable according to this report. And it also, one of the byproducts is lithium which is scarce in our world. And they're finding that that is a byproduct of, of this geothermal effort that's happening. And that powers electric vehicles and all sorts of other things that we need in order to become more sustainable. So that was on the news hour and a lot of people watch it. And that was a good news story about, look, there are other things that are happening here that are positive. Oh, that's great. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming, and Sue, for your presentation. Um, I'm looking at the clock, and I, I don't want to keep, keep all of you too much past 7 o'clock, but I know Andrea has some parting words and I think a video as well. Um, and I don't know, Sue, if you have any, any last words you want to say to give you the floor before Andrea. Well, thank you. I just really enjoyed being with you all tonight. It's been great. Um, if you'd like to sign up for my newsletter, it's on my website at sueinches.com. Um, and it's just been a real pleasure to, to be with you. So thank you for that. And thanks for all the good work you're doing as well. Um, really, really appreciate it. Uh, a real quick question. So is anybody else dying to say something before I do the wrap? <laughs> Tom, your hand is still up. Are you... Okay, so Suzanne, also the chat, are you gonna share that with the people who registered for tonight's talk? Share the chat? Yeah, with the contents of the chat, are you, are you planning to share that or should people just paste, copy it if they wanna refer I would, to it? Yeah, copy it if you, if you wanna refer to it or open okay. the links um, before yeah. the, the Zoom ends. Yeah, yeah that because would because Jen's been dropping a lot of good stuff in there as have other people. And actually I saved the chat um, on my end. So if anybody wants it, just contact Southern Maine Planeteers and I'll email it to you. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, two of my favorite quotes I put in there from Alice Walker and James Baldwin too. So, um, so those are treasures. Um, so, and also this is not the end of the conversation, I hope. Um, we will be back here three weeks from now, again, same, same bad channel, um, April 19th. And the, the focus on that one will be, hopefully many of you will have read Advocating for the Environment. And you certainly heard Sue tonight. It doesn't matter what town you're in. The idea is that we can start brainstorming. The kind of thing has started happening here already um, tonight. Then we can start brainstorming what we might be doing on our own, urging others to do, helping others might you know, join us in doing. So I leave you with two prompts. One is in reading and or listening to Sue Inches, do you find to be, what, what do you find to be most compelling in terms of taking action? So that's one question. Again, what in reading or listening to Sue do you find to be most compelling in terms of taking action? And that's whether or not you come back in three weeks. <laughs> the other part, and this one's even bigger, is what vision is propelling you forward most? And how would you like others to play into that? And I think if we all just did that and asked ourselves that very simple question, um, I think we would come to an interesting discovery of sorts. Um, so I will try now to share my screen so you can see a three minute video which will introduce you to the other planeteers, some of them who are here with us tonight and some who are not able to be here. Um, so if you have three minutes, you wanna uh, see if I can get this up for you, uh, please stay here. But thanks so much for joining us and stay in touch. Thank you. Um, let's see, we'll have to go to share screen. Uh, I'm trying my best. Uh. Oh,
always concerned about the environment. Whenever ecosystems were threatened or damaged by human activity, I'd pay attention. But I was rarely moved to actually do something about it until November of 2016, when extreme environmental threats really loomed large. The Planeteers have been therapeutic for me. These folks helped me put my worries to work. The Planeteers to me are kind of like this forest. It's like hope, collaboration, creativity, patience, um, and resilience because we keep evolving. I too am a proud member of the Planeteers. Uh, I joined the group because I truly believe in the power of education. I believe that um, when people are, are uh, informed, that can affect positive change because they become more empowered uh, and feel more connected to um, not only their communities, but their, their natural world. Uh, working with the Planeteers leads to greater community resilience because the Planeteers are inclusive, they care about science, they care about the environment, and they care about the community. From projects seeking to inform people how to make hotels for insects, which helps our smallest creatures, to projects that hope to combat global climate change, the Planeteers are always seeking to make the community, both in Maine and globally, a better place. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jen, and I'm a Planeteer because I am inspired by and love the camaraderie of working with my fellow community members in an effort to educate and collaborate with our neighbors in our shared commitment of preserving this beautiful earth. And it's just more fun this way. I'm always amazed at what we are able to accomplish together. The Planeteers of Southern Maine are a fun group of people. Whenever I have the opportunity to engage with Planeteers, I come out not only more informed, but inspired. From monitoring beach erosion and debris to building bee motels, bird and bed houses, the Planeteers offer many opportunities for thoughtful and creative input. When I first retired, I was delighted to attend the 2016 meeting when Planeteers first gathered as local compatriots in environmental efforts. Even though we have focused on diverse endeavors as individual, we support each other in our active pursuits in the community and beyond. Pepper has worked with the Planeteers on several educational programs over the last couple of years, from a seed bomb making project with the teens to a series about Maine's Climate Action Plan. They bring their creativity, enthusiasm, knowledge, hard work, and passion for the environment to every project. The Wells Reserve relies on the Planeteers to keep us abreast of state and local environmental issues and to always be ready to pitch in when the needs arise and needs always arise. With this climate challenge, every effort helps. Well, thank you fellow Planeteers and partners. I'm reminded seeing St. Nick here at the end. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> uh. Well, so I, I, sorry about that. No worries. It was, it was nice to hear the voiceover. We didn't need the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy.